Let's go ahead and get to it. Greg, take it away. Welcome, Boar Lord. The world has not been the same since the moon landed on Earth and revealed its very core. Deep in the satellite's rocky heart lies the white dragon, Tsukiyumi, once a powerful deity, before his brothers and sisters banished him to the eternal night millennia ago. Back on Earth, after his long exile, he is bent on recapturing what was taken from him, but his return has plunged the world into chaos. Continents have shattered, animals and plants have disappeared from the face of the planet, and humanity has all been but wiped out. A deep rift runs from Asia via Europe and North America to the former Pacific Ocean, which has turned into a wretched puddle due to the upheaval of the land masses. From the marshy bottom of the former sea, Tsukiyumi commands his army of Oni, a host of deadly warriors who will help him establish a new reign. They prey on the last remaining survivors of the old world and the new beings that have emerged since Tsukiyumi's cataclysmic return, highly evolved creatures, human-machine hybrids, and dragon beings that arose from the molten lava of the Earth's mantle. The scattered human populations have mobilized their last reserves, and while some are equipped with advanced battle suits, others enter battle flanked by wild beasts. A fierce battle for supremacy in this new world has begun, and the battle cry is, everyone against everyone, but everyone against Tsukiyumi. All right, thank you, Boar Lord, Greg. All right, so in Tsukiyumi Full Moon, Full Moon Dawn, each player represents a faction fighting for domination in a world threatened by the moon god Tsukiyumi, as Greg just alluded to. Players are going to produce units, going to conquer areas and complete missions while also dealing with Tsukiyumi's legion of Oni on the way to hopefully becoming the dominant faction in the new world. All right, there's a lot of stuff that you guys are looking at here, so let's go ahead and go over it. First off, we have the main board, which is made up of the moon, which is comprises of seven areas there, as well as 21 other area tiles for a three-player game. We did truly randomize this. We could have done it to where the moon was on one side and dragged it out, but we figured kind of the way we dispersed everything felt fairly balanced for a three-player game, but it's random, and you can set it up however you want. There are scenarios in the back of the rule book that we could have done, but we chose to do it this way. There are five types of tiles. There's the moon tiles, there are the ocean floor, all these white tiles out here, which are just nondescript standard tiles. Then we have fertile ground, and in this one we only actually have three fertile ground spaces out here. We have a couple of mountain hexes, Actually, we actually have three of them. It looks like one, two, and three up there. Then everybody has their home zones. So we have the Boar Lords up here. We have the Dark Seed over here. And over there, Rand's Comp Group 3 over there, which stay as far away from me as you can. In addition, uh, some areas or each area may have some sort of property associated with it. So you can see the Tsukuyumi symbols in some of these, and there are unstable areas as well out on the board. We'll cover all that as we go along. Faction units are also going to be out here all over the board. Now these, the version that we're playing with come with standees, but honestly a top-down camera on standees doesn't make for the most compelling look. So we actually have taken everybody out of their standees, so the board's going to get kind of cluttered with them laying down here, but we have a fix for that as well when it comes to the battle, some more on that later. Off board, we have the initiative track, which is turn order, and that's going to be seated by the number that's on the bottom of each of these. So I'm going to go first uh, at the beginning, Rand second, and Greg third. Then we have the available ent uh, events and the event deck, which is over there, as you can see. Then we have the faction mission cards, which are available for all the players to achieve. Each player will be able to achieve each of those potentially once. Then just above that, we have the victory point board, where we'll be placing our control markers as victory point markers as we accumulate victory points, hopefully. Then there are various area property effect markers. So we have radioactive, we have unstable, Tsukuyumi, negation, all this. We also have block, blockade markers over here as we need them as well. Then we have Oni units here, as well as various markers and more cards and such for the Oni that'll make sense as we go along. Moving over to the player tableaus, 
Well, my bugs, my bugs have a lot of stuff here, but everybody has a faction sheet. This faction sheet is actually double-sided, as you can see, like so. But starting out talking about what you guys are looking at here, they are asymmetric player boards at the very top. We have the faction name as well as the difficulty of playing each faction, or at least difficulty of playing each faction well. So we'll see how we do with the Dark Seed tonight. Then we have the faction effect, which this is going to come into play when an action card says so, and all of these are asymmetric. Then a possible special defense action, a bonus defense rating next to that, and then a faction-specific goal, which will gain you some number of victory points, as shown here. Then the cost and abilities of the various faction units, so you can see the various bugs that I have for my faction there. Now on the back side of that player board, you show, it shows the starting units, which we have not set up yet, so you guys are going to be privy to the setup as well. More detailed faction effect as well, and then various special rules that apply to my faction and my faction only. All right. Now moving over to the right of that, we have co faction combat cards, and each faction's combat cards are going to have different actions at the top as well as different counter attacks that the other players are going to be able to trigger as we go along. Then a hand of six randomly drawn action cards which have look like this on one side and then to show you guys some non-in-play ones they look like this on the other side. Okay, Some will have more of the different colors than others as we go along. And, of course, we have the faction unit. So I have a ton of ants, a handful of breeders, some wasps, a fair amount of warriors, three conquerors, one planter, and two stingers. Whereas, you take a look over here at Rand's faction, those are all his units. He has a total of five units. So it's the antithesis of mine. So his are big and strong, mine are weak but plentiful. All right. So just to give you an idea of the asymmetry uh, in the game. Now, a reminder that we are playing the core game with just the core rules, which means we're not going to be playing any of the expansion stuff. And, Rand, if you can show me one of the tiles on the back side here, they come with an orange border tile. We are not going to be playing with any of these. So all these tiles come prepared for the expansion as well. So that pretty much covers everything that you guys are looking at. Now, how do you play the game? Well, Tsukuyumi is played over four rounds, although you could play it over three or five rounds if you want a shorter or longer game. The base game is set at four rounds. We're playing four rounds. Each of those four rounds follows the same series of steps, with most be actions being optional. After the four rounds, there's a final scoring. Whoever has the most victory points is the dominant faction, wins the game. So each round is divided into the same three phases. Phase one, select an action card. So what does that mean? Well, select one of our six action cards that we have here. Easy enough. The second phase is execute that chosen action card. The third phase is a kind of intermediate scoring phase. Do that over four rounds, and there you go. That's the game. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than just that. So we'll start off with phase one, selecting an action card. Each player, as I said, has a hand of six action cards that they're going to secretly choose one, place it face down in front of them, and each of these action cards has an identical back on the white side for the white phase, okay? Whereas, on the other side, they're going to be very asymmetric between the dif different actions. So it could be something like, okay, I choose this card, boom, done, there we go. And that is selecting an action card, pretty easy. So that's the first phase, okay? Every action is optional except for anything that activates the Oni. These are must-take actions, okay? I just wanted to stress that before we go any further, okay? The Oni being the, uh, the game uh, neutral faction in the game. So that's phase one, select an action card. Phase two begins with executing the chosen action card. Once all players have chosen an action card, players are then going to execute the cards color phase by color phase in initiative order. So initiative order being as so, and obviously in a higher player, uh, more player, higher player count game, there will be more factions out there. 
Each player is going to complete one colored phase before moving on to the next player executing that same colored phase. So at the beginning of, the, of each round, we're, me being the first player, I'm going to execute the white phase. Then, looking out here, then Rand is going to execute the white phase. Then Greg. Then we're going to flip over our cards, and then I'm going to execute any of the blue actions that I want. Then Rand will, then Greg will. Then I'll do green, so on and so forth, until we get through all of the actions, then we go into the scoring round. Okay, so that's how the actual execution works. However, let's go ahead and go into this. The four colored phases, which are always executed in the same order as I mentioned, white, then blue, then green, then red. And now is a good time to point out, faction rule breakers trump anything that's on a card. Anything on a card trumps the written rules. That's pretty common amongst board games, I think, but just know this trumps this, which trumps base rules, okay? All right, before we go over the colored phases, let's go over the various actions that are possible in the game. The first option is shown right here, which is use your faction effect. So for me, my faction effect is this. The conqueror may always be used, meaning my conquerors can always be used if I choose to. And then I can choose two of these things. Okay, move all my units. All my units are considered flying, and then my breeders and planters may place eggs. Okay, so that is my faction effect. That's going to change between all the players because, Rand, what's your faction effect? You do not have a fashion effect. Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> as you can see, that's going to be different amongst all of us. All right. So, that's the fashion effect. Then, changing initiative up or down. So, as you can see here, climb up or down two places in the initiative track. Again, this is always voluntary. This is pretty self-explanatory. All other players stay in relative order. Okay? So, that happens immediately when you make that change. So, Pretty simple that I would move down one or two spaces. Okay, easy enough. Not to belabor that, let's move on. Next is drawing and playing events. So as you can see here, draw one event card and play up to one event card. Okay, well, let's take a look at the event cards. You always have a choice of three options to draw from. The two face up, or as we like to call it, mystery meat, top off the deck. You may choose to play it, or you can choose to keep it. There's no hand limit size on how many events you may uh, store up to. If you keep it, you can play it or any other previously kept event card on a subsequent turn if you wish to. And they're all pretty simple. At the very top, in fact, let me have one and I'll show folks over here. So an event card looks a lot like this. So it says what it is. It has some flavor text at the top. And then down here at the bottom, it has a symbol of what it does. And then it has the actual action, turn an area tile in any direction, cannot be applied to moon areas. Well, that's good because the moon is one big seven tile area. But easy enough doing an event. Any questions on those? Nope. All right, moving on. Next is production. So I'll go ahead and flip this card over, show this to y'all here. Produce units or upgrades to a value of two. All right, now we're actually gonna talk about getting more units out on the board. Or but when I say units, it could be weapons, upgrades, or anything else that comes into play. In the case of my faction, it's just units. In the case of Rand's faction, it is upgrades, it's weapons, and Greg also has upgrades and special little tiles that he can bring into play as well. So new units are going to come into the home zone or directly adjacent to it. So meaning this being my home zone down here, the yellow tile for the nest for the dark seed, a directly adjacent would be here, here, or here. Easy enough. Blockades, which are these red borders that you see on some of these tiles. These do not block this. So let me give you an example. If this were turned like so, I still could produce in this tile ignoring this blockade. However, it does block when it goes for movement. So even though they produced here, I wouldn't be able to travel across that, okay? But thankfully, randomness was in my favor and it actually ended up like so. So I can produce here, 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 or there. The cost for the various units is shown on 
the faction sheet. So you can see these cost one production, these three units here. These cost two production here. And my stinger, the big boy, costs three production. In addition to that, there may be some things down below. It, show, it says here, can be made into a warrior or planter or a conqueror for one production. So I can upgrade units where they are as well. Okay? So, as I said, each faction may also have rule breakers to the above rules, which again, these guys might be able to spawn out in other places, which I can, but we'll talk more about that when we get into faction specific stuff. All production must be used or lost at the end of that action. Meaning, I get to produce units uh, up to a value of two. I cannot save that. I cannot do one of these and then do another late. No, you either do use it or lose it. Okay. So that's pretty much production. Not a whole lot to it. It's pretty self-explanatory at that point. Any questions on production? Nope. All right, cool. Moving on to movement. All right. So let's put some actual guys out here on the board like so, and I'll throw him out there as well. That's good enough for movement, I think, for the most part. Movement always means any and all of your units may move up to the number of areas described in a given action. Meaning, if you can move, you get to move all of your units on the board. Okay? So, I'm going to have a ton of units. I get to move every single one once for every movement action that I get. Units can never move across red bordered areas. I say never. Well, flying units actually have a little symbol right here that show they're flying. What does that mean? They get to ignore blocked areas like so. All right. So my wasps can freely move across the blocked areas. All right. Obviously, units cannot leave the board edges. There's no warping from one side to the other or moving across gaps in the map area if there were. So, for instance, it is possible that when we randomly put this out, it was like so. You would not be able to move over this way. You would have to come around this way or some other way. However, we don't have a whole lot of gaps. Here, you can't do something like that. Units always move individually as well. So, with that said, moving into any adjacent area not blocked by a blockade, is always allowed, regardless of where you are. So let me get one of your behemoths out here, if I can. So we have a massive unit like so, and I have my puny little ant here like so. They start in the same area. They, starting my action for movement, they're in the same area. I can always move my ant freely to an adjacent, when I, when I get a movement, I may always freely move you may start your movement and move to an adjacent hex always. However, or one last thing to stress on that, regardless if the area you're leaving from has enemy units or not. However, if the area includes units of a different faction, they may be forced to stop to be to stop move. So for instance, I have uh, let's say let's say my wasps here have a movement let's say they have a movement of two he can move across the border here and he could conceivably move to another area however he may be trapped there due to other enemy units being in the area to be able to move through an area that contains enemy units and all other factions are technically enemy units the total amount of health points of the moving faction have to meet or exceed the number of health points of all enemy units combined. All right, so now would be a good time to go ahead and show you guys one of, and I'll go and bring that over here so it's a little bit clearer, bring it here. So each unit has a number in the top left-hand corner, which is its conquer number. Then where the little heart is, is the health points and its attack value over on the top right. So you'll see that my wasp here has a five, five, and five, as you can see, okay? Whereas Rand's big old behemoth here, his uh, Beowulf, he has 50 health, I have five. To be able to move through an area that has the, the Beowulf in it, I would have to, between all of my units, have a combined health of 50 or higher to move through it. However, 
I don't. So what does that mean? Well, if my wasp moved from this area down to here, he cannot leave this area on the same action, meaning move through because his health is lower than his health. Okay? If Greg actually had, say, his boar master out here as well, just for space, that would actually be a total of 80 health I would need to be able to move through there. Now we're just adding insult in it, to injury. However, that's, my mo that's one movement. That's the movement action. If later on in the round, I get a separate movement action, I'm starting here with there, I then can go ahead and move away, no problem, if I wish to, because I started my movement at that location. I'm, I'm really driving this point home, but it's really important. The difference between moving there or moving to a location, no problem, but going through a location, you have to have greater than or equal to health to be able to move through. Does that make sense? Yes. Any questions here locally? All right, cool. Then that said, let's go ahead and keep moving. All right, I don't want to belabor movement anymore. However, there is one more little important note. All movement must be completed prior to any combat actions being played. This means that once a combat action was chosen by a faction, they may no longer choose any movement actions the rest of the entire round. So in other words, if I do anything that causes me to play a combat card and I want to move later in a round, I cannot. Okay? There may be instances uh, that happen that force movement, which is allowed, but choosing a movement action is not allowed. The actual movement action. You can't choose it once combat's initiated. That makes sense? Yep. All right, cool. Moving on. Well, let's go ahead and talk about combat. Let's get this big boy out of here, though, because that's going to be real rough for me. All right, so there are two types of combat in Tsukuyumi. There are attacks versus enemy units, and there are there's the ability to conquer and control the area to be able to get victory points because each of these control markers that's out here on the board is going to be worth victory points at the end of the game. Each combat action uses, well, one combat action. So let me show you guys an example here. So coming back to my tableau, you'll see here it says execute up to two combat actions. Those are two individual actions. So I would be able to have two combats, both against enemies, both against the land to be able to conquer the land or one of each if I wish to or neither or just one. Remember, it's always voluntary in these cases. Active player is always the attacker and if it's against enemy units, then all present are defenders. So an attack versus enemy units is against all factions in the area. So getting back to that, if we had something along the lines of all these guys in here and let me go ahead and have some sort of a chance. Let's say all of these are in this area right here. And again, normally these would be standees, okay? My combat is going to be against both the Boar Lords as well as the comp group, okay? When combat happens, you follow the following steps. You spend a combat action. Then the attacker selects one of their faction's combat cards. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about the various combat cards here. I'm not going to go over these in detail here, but I would choose one of these four to activate the top part, all right? Then I execute whatever that action is, as shown at the very top of the card. Then each defender in initiative order selects one of the counterattacks listed on that same card, and it could be the same card. So for instance, if I chose this annihilation action, your units cause damage. Okay, easy enough. After I do so, then each of my opponents, starting with the comp group, starting with Rand's faction, then going to Greg's faction, they get to choose one of those four that's listed on this card as a counterattack against me. Okay, so the active player is the only player that ever plays a card during combat. Then after the counterattacks are resolved, and I should point out that counterattacks can be used against other defenders. So even though I'm the attacker, these two can still fight against one another depending on what the counterattack they chose. 
then remove any casualties, then return the card to the attacker. All right. Now, all attacks and all counterattacks happen simultaneously. Therefore, even if all the defenders would be eliminated by an attacker, they still get their parting shot in. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about now how this works. Well, we'll start out with conquering an area. That would be the conquest action. Conquest action says only playable if you have at least as many conquest points as your opponents. Mark the area with one of your territory markers. All right, so let's take a look at what this will be. So we look at the conquest. The conquest is the big number in the top left-hand corner, and we're actually going, when we actually uh, have combat during the game, we're going to zoom in for all of this. But I have a total of 15, 5, 5, and 5, so those add up for a total of 30 conquests. In this example, let's say uh, Rand is there. He has a total of 15. Well, in that case, if he had one of his markers that was already in this area, I would then remove that. I would re give that back to him. And then I would place one of mine. If there wasn't one, I would just place one of mine. Easy enough. That has no effect on the actual units. All right. However, he does have a unit present. So what does that mean? he gets to actually do one of the counter attacks that's listed on here. So his defense action, his defense action would be whatever his faction defense action is. Counter strike, the defender's units cause damage. That would be bad for me because it's going to kill a lot of my units. Retreat, the defender surviving units may move into an adjacent area according to the rules, meaning you can't go over blockades, etc., etc. Or pushback. The Dark Siege units must retreat into adjacent areas in the direction of their home zone according to the rules. Again, following the same rules, not being able to go over blockades unless they're flying. All right, that's, that's combat for conquering. It's really simple. It's not too hard. It's, is the numbers bigger than that number? Easy enough. I would obviously fail if Greg's unit was there because he has 60. Note, these two do not stack, so it's not 60 plus 15, it's just 60. Take the bigger number between the factions, and I would fail. Well, then, <laughs> in turn order, Rand would get to counterattack on my card, and then Greg would get to counterattack on my card, and all those units would come into play at that point. Any questions on conquering areas? Nope. nope. All right. Attacking units is annihilation. I love the word they chose for this. So annihilation says your units cause damage. All right, so how does that work? It works as described in the earlier sequence. So we would take a look. All of my units do a total of their attack, 5, 10, 15, and 20 for a total of 35. Multiple factions are present. So therefore, as the attacker, I get to choose how many damage points are assigned to each faction. Well, I have 35 total. And we have 15 here, or I'm sorry, we're looking at health now. They have, he has 30 health, he has 30 health. I have a total of 35 damage. Well, let's say I choose 30 on Rand and 5 on Greg. Well, they then both get to counterattack, but the 30 damage, because it meets or exceeds his health, this unit would actually come back into Rand's supply to possibly be produced later on. The 5 points that the Boar Master absorbs, well, he just absorbs it because there's no carryover for the differ over across different combats. So he just absorbed it, no harm, no foul. That Basically, that gets wasted. If you don't kill it, it's wasted. All right? If there's multiple units? Yeah, if there are multiple units. So let's say it were something like this, and you'll notice that he, between the units, he has a total of 40 health. I do 35 damage. Well, if it's just me versus Greg in this case, well, I say, Greg, you get all 35, all you can eat. He chooses how to distribute this. So he could choose to go, well, the first 10 goes to the squeaker. So the squeaker would die. And then the residual 25 would come over to his boar master. But 25 is lower than 30, so he just absorbs it. No harm, no foul. He would come back. But again, he would get to counterattack as normal, okay? So the recipient of the damage and damage would come potentially back my way. I get to choose how to distribute it as the faction owner of that damage. 
is a good way to think of it. And attacker versus defender, easy enough. Any questions on attacking? Nope. All right. So regardless of the result, control markers are never affected in this area when you're fighting with annihilation, okay? So this has nothing to do with control. It has to do strictly with faction on faction violence, so unit on unit violence, okay? All of the above actions now are always optional. However, the next two now on a card, these are mandatory. So let's go ahead and talk about the first one. We have a placing Oni. So you'll see this is always going to be in the green phase, at least to the best of my knowledge, it's always in the green phase. The two options or the two actions that are mandatory are placing Oni and an Oni conquest. So we haven't talked about really Oni yet. What are Oni? Well, Oni are neutral factions and these are going to be controlled by the players collectively. Oni are their own faction for the active player. Whoever controls the Oni, i.e. the active player, at any given time, they're acting as the Oni and their own faction does not apply. So whenever I have to place Oni, I'm worried about this. I, it has nothing to do with my own faction. And when Oni Conquest, notice they have an Oni Conquest card. So I will be playing as the Oni, as the active player, if I have those actions on the selected action card. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. All right, so placing Oni, this one's pretty simple. All Oni are valued at the same for production and placing. So any Oni can be chosen. It says place any two Oni. Well, the Oni range from five conquests all the way up to 30, and there are a couple of legendaries. We'll talk about the legendaries separately in a little bit. So choosing, well, if, they're, if I wanna place them close to me, maybe I choose the weak ones. If I put them towards the fellas, maybe I choose some of the big and strong ones, all right? Placement is on any Tsukuyumi space on the board or any adjacent space to a Tsukuyumi space. However, you'll note that blockades do matter. So with this Tsukuyumi space here, could not place here because of the blockade, but could place here, could place there, all right? Does that make sense? Yep. Whereas it's adjacent to this Tsukuyumi space, so you could still place here, just not from there. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. If multiple Oni are being placed, they can go to the same or different areas on the board. And if there are no Oni available, we are playing really, really poorly. But if there are none, you have to then perform an Oni conquest instead. However, if it says place two Oni and there's only one left, well, at least I partially fulfilled it, so ignore the Oni con conquest part of that. All right. Oh, oh one other thing I, I failed to mention. Oni. If they're part of the defenders, they get to retaliate too. They get to counterattack. They're a neutral faction. So if I attack, say, Greg here, well, I'm also attacking the Oni, and they get to counterattack as well, based off of the card that I play. All right? Now, the two legendary Oni here, placements like normal Oni, but only one of them may be on the board at a given time. And as you can see, they have their own cards and their own special rules. Honestly, we'll just cover those when they come into play. I think that's the best way to do that. All right. But they're just rule breakers and a little bit strong and more annoying if they're against you. All right. So those are all the available actions to players on the action cards themselves. So we do the white phase, then I would start the blue phase, then we would go in initiative order for the blue phase, again, doing things optionally if you wish to, then the green phase, then the red phase, with the caveat that Oni actions are always mandatory. Then we go into intermediate scoring. One other thing, the six action cards that we all, that we all got dealt at the beginning of the game, whichever one we choose as our action, the other five are going to get passed to our left. And then next round, they're going to be passed to the left again. And then they're going to come back to me. So the game plays over four rounds. So four of these six are going to be chosen. So you're always going to have a choice of three in a four-round game. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So the intermediate scoring. All victory points gained have players placing control markers on the victory point card. So it's visible to all players. So easy enough. Control the center of the moon at the end of a round. Right here, this one hex, it's worth a victory point. You get to place one there each round. 
If your faction goal is reached, you score whatever victory points it shows. So right here, it says conquest, uh, conquer six plus areas in one round, but possibly over multiple phases. You don't have to hold them. You just have to have conquered them. That'll be worth two points. So if I did get that, I would get two of my markers and place them out on the victory point marker. This is a one-time goal, though, however. Then, any missions completed. Now, we each have individual missions. However, they're open for all of us to complete. So, here, the mine is control seven areas at the end of a round. So, you have to have seven control markers at any given time at the end of a round. If so, you get to place one of your markers from your supply on here. And once you've completed it, you can only complete each one once. Destroy three Oni, possibly over multiple rounds. Every time you kill an Oni, take one of these, unless you're Rand and you kill 12 in a round, then, well, taken care of. But for the rest of us, if you only kill one at a time, just take these markers to show how many that you've killed. And here we have conquer two Tsukuyumi areas. So any areas that have these locations on it, place a control marker. If you have two of those, boom, mission accomplished. If it's not the end of the fourth round, start a new round. Otherwise, go into final scoring. So final scoring, pretty, pretty simple. One victory point for control marker that you have on the board. Fertile ground area, so these locations here you'll see show they're worth two victory points a piece. Whoever's first in initiative order gets two victory points at the end of the game. Whoever's in second in initiative order gets one point. And any other points they've gained throughout the whole game, whoever has the most points wins. The only thing I think I didn't cover is mountains specifically. This adds to the, uh, the conquer number to be able to conquer a mountain area. So you must have that number plus any units that are in there for the highest value, etc., etc. And that, folks, is how you play Tsukuyumi Full Moon Down.